To date, we have donated 57 trained police dogs in the 10 years. Over half a million dollars yeah. that we have saved departments money on doing this, which is Incredible. amazing. But those rescue dogs, mainly the ones that we pull from, from shelters, normally will just be a single purpose scent detection dog. We don't make them into any sort of patrol dog because again, we also have a very important job to fulfill to train these dogs to protect their handler. Absolutely. So we, we take our job very seriously what people don't see is the back office of how we are constantly saying, nope, not that dog. Nope, not this dog. They're only seeing the happy stories. So out of the 57, there's hundreds that unfortunately we had to turn down in order to make a, a good quality uh, police dog. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Big Dog Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Wilson. Logan is in the background. How you doing, son? Good. Good. I got that, you know, always riveting conversation with uh, Logan Wilson. It's big time. Well, look, we're continuing a mini series that we're running right now. And this is new, you know, for the, the Big Dog Podcast. We're getting heavy in the dogs. And two years in, and we've never been dog topics which is kind of funny because everyone's like josh like you're the dog trainer like the, the, what what's going on but the show's definitely business mindset family driven um but we're getting into dogs here these next couple months and we're trying to bring in the best of the best and influential people um in the space and you know share their stories and today i couldn't be more excited to introduce you to carol skaziak and she is the founder and ceo of the throwaway dogs project um and canine law and order and incredible nonprofits doing really big things um here in the u.s and carol thank you so much for joining us today oh thanks for having me it's be a lot of fun. We know a lot of the same people, you know, and I've heard a ton about you and, you know, some of our friends that we share. Some are super respectable. Some are kind of suspect, but that's kind of, you know, the dog world in and of itself. But welcome, you know, to the Big Dog Podcast and tell us a little bit about you. Well, thanks again for having me. And yes, you are absolutely right. Um, it The dog world definitely is is a small world. And um, it's a pleasure to actually meet you and, and see you. Um, so yeah, I have, um, I have been in this industry now for 10 years. Uh, we are going on a, 11 years. And to be honest with you, how this started, it really was never even on my radar. Yeah. So uh, 10 years ago, I was a, a PR and marketing uh, person for a luxury boarding facility. Okay. And one of my jobs was to write a newsletter every, every month. And it was really one of my arch nemesis. I hated doing it. It was hard to come up with topics and it would go out to the clients. So what was happening over the past few months prior to that, we were having clients bring dogs in and they were leaving the dogs. They weren't coming to pick it up. And, and, and we would try and rehome the dog. Lawyers had to get involved and yeah. it was happening over and over again. So I decided, you know what, this month I'm going to write an article on the throwaway society of dogs. And I wrote this great article and I showed it to, to the owner and he said, nah, we're not doing this. It's too depressing. He's like, turn it around, make it something positive and and we'll go with that. Yeah. So I did what everybody does. I I'm, I was like, okay, we'll do a contest. Tell me how your 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 rescue dog saved you, and the the twelve great stories I will put in a calendar. We'll get a photographer. We'll have everybody in for a month. But the best story is going to go on the cover. Yeah. So um, it it actually worked out. Clients were responding, and we were getting all these great stories. And the twelve best ones, you know, we hired a photographer, but the one story that stood out was who is now my partner, uh, Jason Walters, who is a canine handler for step to transit. Yep. And his partner was uh, a rescue dog that was moments away from being euthanized mm. and, um, who is now is, was his partner and he was an explosive and patrol dog. Okay. And I love the story. 
Um, I put, you know, I put it in words and we, 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 we plastered Winchester on, on the cover and, and he is our, you know, our, our cover dog now for 10 years. He has been his famous jump over, over the barrels. (laughs) Um, But being in PR and marketing, now it was my job to promote the heck out of this. So I did. Um, I, I promoted the heck out of this calendar and we were, it took off. We were in every newspaper, every news station. Um, we were even in magazines at that point. That's and awesome. after the dust settled, I'm like, I was just so touched by all of this. I'm like, I think I really want to try and do something about it. Yeah. And my husband is in law enforcement in Philadelphia. So okay. I've been married for um, for 25 years. He, he has been serving 26 years uh, with the Philadelphia Police Department. So I am awesome. definitely a part of the family in blue. Just right. never have really been involved in the canine world. Yep. And I asked Jason, uh, who, you know, who is my partner, um, you know, will you do this with me? Will you help me? I could, I could be, you know, the, the mastermind, but I need you to physically help me with these dogs. Yeah. We, we kicked it off. The first couple years was absolutely atrocious. Um, we didn't know what we were doing. We sure. tried our best and, you know, we would pull in a shelter dog or two. After like the third and fourth year, we started to develop like a, a reputation, a good yeah. reputation. And it just started to increase and increase. And then as very influential canine um, people in the industry started to learn about us, they, they would call us and say, hey, you know what? We think you're doing a great thing. So we, yeah. want to, we want to be a part of that. And believe me, being a woman in this industry, when I first started a civilian right. <laughs> and a woman, yeah. um, it was brutal. Like it was, it was brutal. Uh, but I definitely earned the respect of the people that I, I want to, re- you know, earn that respect from in this industry. Sure. And um, I, I love it. I love it. That's awesome. And, you know, specifically the big thing that you guys are doing is you're, you're finding these throwaway dogs and repurposing, training, rehabbing with the hope of placing with different agencies. Correct. So when we did first start out, um, it was basically, we were, we were looking at owner surrender dogs, um, shelter dogs and rescue dogs. And to be honest with you, I said we, we we hit a lot of brick walls at the beginning yeah. because we wanted to save them all. And as you know, being in the dog industry, you can't save them all. No. And that was the hardest battle that I had to overcome. I can't save them all. Yeah. So we started out that way. And then we realized, hey, you know what? We're, we're pulling too many dogs. We're spending all this money and time with training them. And now we don't have a place to put them. Right. So- we, we kind of restructured what we, we have done. We built our reputation. And now when the applications come in, we go out and find the dogs that will specifically match for that department. Fit that need. Then we'll yeah. start our training process. That's awesome. Yes. That's, that's incredible. So you're not, it, it, which makes a lot of sense too, right? Because if you're pulling every dog that you might be able to do something with, but there isn't necessarily a need for that right. dog and what its particular skills um, and strengths are. But if you're able to know, hey, this department has needs X, Y, Z, this department is short on, you know, you know, detection. Yes. You know, it's some great patrol dogs, but they're not doing great on drugs and, you know, explosives, things like that. It's like, okay, you can go out now with yes. very intentional purpose, look for some common traits and now, okay, does this dog have what it takes at a baseline to have the potential to, to fill that slot? So, I mean, no, that makes a whole lot of sense. And I can definitely yeah. tell how in the beginning where it's like, all right, let's get this dog. Let's get that dog. Let's let's do. And next thing you know, you got 38 dogs at your house. Right. And in, in all reality, I know that the name um, kind of says that we are a rescue. And sure. we're really not a rescue. Right. right. We don't hold on to these dogs. And throughout the years, because of we built up such a, a stellar reputation, we also now have reputable breeders and brokers that say to us, you know what? I love what you're doing. Here's a dog. Yep, so we have awesome. like a, a genuine working line dog that now we can also be able to pay it forward. Yeah, that's so, great. 
to date, we have donated 57 trained police dogs in the 10 years. It's over, over half a million dollars yeah. that we have saved departments, you know, money on doing this, which is Incredible. amazing. But those rescue dogs, mainly the ones that we pull from, from shelters, normally will just be a single purpose scent detection dog. Right, yeah. Um, we, we don't make them into any any sort of patrol dog because, again, we also have a very important job to f- fulfill to train these dogs to protect their handler. Absolutely. So we, we take our job very seriously. Um, what people don't see is the back office of how we are constantly saying – Nope, not that dog. Nope, not this dog. Oh, yep. that dog's washed out. They're only seeing the happy story. So out of the 57, there's hundreds that unfortunately right. we had to turn down um, in order to make a, a good quality uh, police dog. Yeah, but and the point you make is so true. I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and, you know, I know you've seen it. I mean, far more times than I have. But, you know, when there's a failure in the field and the of of a patrol dog and 90 plus percent of the time when that dog fails in a situation it's uh training lack of training or that dog was never going to be that dog to begin with and maybe it's limited resources by the department maybe it's limited resources and abilities uh by the handler because of limited resources from the department there's a lot of things that can go into it but when that dog is in a situation and it's not able to execute at the highest level needed it it does the handlers absolutely and anybody else around is also at risk. It becomes such a huge liability. And I, I, that's another reason why I love what you guys are doing, you know, with the placements and specific to the needs of the department, not just peddling dogs, you're filling specific needs, which is going to go and help that handler, help that community and, you know, be a strong influence in that, that department and, and region. And the right dog is so, so paramount and people think i'm on the pet side right Mm -hmm. and so people like hey josh i got this german shepherd um you know let's go ahead and get started on protection training and and this and that and i just crack up laughing Mm -hmm. or my favorite is whatever enunciation they want to put on uh malinois that's always the best you know malinois you know bohemian malinois uh, whatever mm-hmm. people want to say all these crazy things yeah it's like hey i got one let's teach it to do this i'm like time out you know, that's yeah. not the qualifier. The qualifier isn't the breed of the dog. And no. <laughs> if you would, if you could only see how many emails, phone calls, and messages that come in on a daily basis, literally hundreds, you know, of mainly owner surrenders, yep. and they have the perfect dog and and make a great, you know, police dog. He's only had five bites and he bit yeah. my kid in the face. And it's like, perfect. We, we, that's not what we're looking for. And, yeah. you know, but the general public doesn't understand they that don't. it does take a, a special dog, a certain quality. Yep. Um, so back in 2016, um, I actually dabbled in um, doing pit bulls. Okay. Um, did not want to do this. Um, and I, I, I have to admit it. Like I kicked and screamed. Um, we did get, um, somebody emailed us and sent videos of this one pit bull and I'll be damned. Like the videos showed everything that th- this dog had everything. Right. And I'm like, Oh, do we do this? Do we not do this? Well, we ended up taking her in and she kind of, really made this is she kind of put us on the map believe it or not um because we made international news because of 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 her being a pit bull yeah and we did we trained her up uh it was a hard job for me to place her because i did not have a placement for her right Um, so i went against my own rules um we took her in we 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 trained her uh, for narcotic detection and it took me a while to find a department that would actually want to try this out. Again, they, they have a bad stigma. And after that, um, we were featured um, in People Magazine in South Africa. Wow, okay. <laughs> which they never knew even existed. Yeah. But it started the ball rolling. And then after her, there was an internationally known dog ring in Canada called uh, Save the 21. 
And okay. there was 21 pit bulls um, that were taken, uh, seized from a dog ring, a dog fighting ring. And um, long story short, these dogs were in custody for about two years. Um, oh, a gentleman wow. and, and his wife from Dog Tales Rescue uh, Sanctuary in Canada fought really hard to, to, to save these 21 dogs that were evaluated inside and out, all around. They were cleared to be safe, yeah. um, which others were euthanized. But these 21 dogs really had something and, and, and a chance to live. So after two years being in custody, um, they were they were saved, uh, but they were ordered out of the province of Ontario okay. and they were sent down to Florida and dogs playing for life took them. OK. And um, we were called in and said, you, you have to come and evaluate some of these dogs. And we took five of those dogs in after doing extensive evaluations and five of those dogs were really had what we wanted in a police dog as far as scent detection. Sure. And we placed three of those in law enforcement and the other two, I ended up adopting one and another one went to um, sort of a companion dog. Okay. But those three dogs <laughs> put us again um, on the map internationally Caesar Milan called us. We were on the Caesar show because of it. That's awesome. It, my, my theory is if they can do the job and they are clear headed and rock solid, why not give them a purpose? Yeah, absolutely. And it changed my life. I was never a pit bull lover. Yeah. I knew nothing about them. It's not that I was discriminative, but I just knew nothing about them. Right. I have to tell you that the dog, and he just passed a few months ago from there, was the best dog that I've ever owned in my life. Like, wow. and it was something, it opened my eyes and I wanted to, I wanted other people to see that. And they did yeah. make a difference in their community. Man, that's such an awesome story too, because that's so out of the box. That's so out of the norm. Right. And it's one of those things where, you know, you ask 50 people and they're like, no, 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 that's bullshit. That didn't, that's not going to happen. That's not going to work. Right. But again, the, the right dog, the right situation, the right attention, the right care, the, the, the preparation, the setup. And you have these dogs from an absolute atrocious, brutal background. Yes where so many places are saying this is the background, they're not getting placed, just euthanize yeah. all. And, you know, the fact that that is 21 were saved, but then those five were on to go on to do other things, even three particularly very special things, that, that that's nowhere on the map as far as their roadmap of those dogs' life and trajectory. And so that's pretty dang incredible. One of the dogs um, we actually sent to Millville Fire Department, and he is the first arson detection pit bull ever, ever. <laughs> he won Law Enforcement Dog of the Year. Uh, we did. Yeah, I, I know, you know this dog. We yeah, we went to a, a gala in Florida with this. Like this was such a huge accomplishment. But it's gonna. It's it doesn't always take just me. I need that that chief, that yep. that that commander to to. Give this a shot. And that's yeah. actually on our application. Are you open to, you know, uh, different breeds, such as a bully breed? I will tell you, a lot of them will say yes. And then when we have our interview, um, they're backpedaling a little bit. Sure. But it's not only up to the chief. Then we have to go to, you know, the town manager, the, the board of the town. Like, it's a big deal. Like, yeah. I don't think that everybody knows when a department gets a dog, it's not the chief of police that just says, OK, you yeah. know, it's the whole community kind of is involved. Is the budget approved? You know, even though your dog is free, it's you still need a budget. Right. And and so. Some of them are open. Some of them are not open. I yeah. have not placed any more since then. Um, it really is a tough sell. I won't give up on it. I'll tell you that. I'll keep trying. But um, it was something that changed my life. It changed. It opened my eyes. And it, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of it. That's awesome. They, um, you're talking about dealing with the different departments and kind of, hey, it's not one person just saying, hey, we need a dog. Um, we have learned that over the years, uh, my, my location up in Detroit with my team up there, they did a therapy dog for 
a department up there that to to work with, you know, officers in the department or that dog can be taken to a let's say it's a domestic thing. There's kids, you yeah. know, the dog can can be there to kind of distract or whatever. And it, it it's really incredible. And so this is years ago. You know, we trained this dog for the department. Their dogs all over social media. They're having a ton of fun with this dog and implementing the dog. And then we get a call from another department in a township, you know, nearby. Then we get a call from another department from a town nearby. And so it's stacking up Mm -hmm. and we just brought in um, a university, their private police department. They are training five therapy dogs uh, for their department for, um, you know, if there's any incidents, but for students, for whatever. But it is a process going through for these agencies and departments to get the dog to fund the acquisition of the dog, the training of the dog, whatever it may be, it is quite the process. And I never thought about it like that. I'm like, well, if you want, just just pay for it. We'll get it set up and gone. No, 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 no. There's a lot of signatures that are in play, but I love seeing how the departments are putting dogs to, to work outside of your typical single dual purpose traditional roles. Um, it's 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 big and when they first approached us about it and telling us what they wanted to do and i started thinking about for me i was thinking about you know domestic incidents and stuff where there's kids who are super confused and not necessarily knowing what's going on and probably what they see on a regular basis isn't great and knowing that a dog can help a kid disconnect from yeah. whatever bullshit's happening in front of them because adults yeah. don't know how to handle themselves yeah um it's it's amazing, and I love seeing the departments apply the dogs for. And these are a totally different type of dog, right? Now, we, yeah. you know, we're, and and that's where it's like, but the dog has a purpose for yes. genetics, the, yes. for how it was bred, um, and that's why people think, oh, it's got pointy ears. Let me go do bite. Mm-hmm. Well, no, mm-hmm. maybe. But right. is, is yes. this a show line point of year? Is this a working line point of year? How is it neutral? Is it stable? Like, what are we what are we looking at with this dog? Well, it loves to bite. It bites everybody. Well, time out. <laughs> That's probably not the dog you want to throw in a, you know, back of a an SUV with a couple officers yeah. on their way to <laughs> you know, yes. do a thing. They're they're trying to prep for you know a mission, and now you got a freaking dog trying to eat everybody you know, in the back, but finding the right dog for that purpose and all the different things that the dogs can do is just incredible. Um, Now talk to me about when did, so 10, 11 years ago, you start this journey and the first couple of years, like anybody going out with something, I mean, it's just a cluster. You're learning, you have the great idea. And now you got to find out practically how we make this work. And relationships are are growing. You know, you're meeting people. You're dealing with different types of dogs. At what point does the canine law and order type trainings and events, when does that start to come into play? So that came into play um, right around when COVID hit. Okay. And it it actually started because you mentioned it earlier. Um, What was happening was I was you spend a lot of time and money into training these dogs and you try and vet the departments that the dog goes to as best that you can. But there's always, there's always bad apples regardless, whether it's law enforcement or not, but there's also budgets in that come into play. And for some reason, maintenance training on, on canines is not always top priority, especially with some of the departments that I was placing dogs with because there's no money. Right. And what was happening was they were breaking my dogs kind of, and the dogs were coming back broken. Uh, Handler was so inexperienced. (laughs) <laughs> or sorry, sorry. no, nah, big so, dog podcast. That's fine. <laughs> so in an uh, inexperience that you know something happened. So it, I'm like, we're spending so much money. Like this, we need to fix this. 
And this was also was right around the time, like when George Floyd happened and defund the police was happening. Yeah. And this was just, it wasn't okay. Right. So I, at this point, I had a lot of um, great names in the canine business that were starting to attach themselves and be a part of my team. And I'm like, how about we start putting training seminars together? Yeah. And um, the first training seminar was 30 handlers and I'll never forget it. And I was so happy. And this one in April, we are right at 100 handlers um, from all over the country. It's and amazing. we are now welcoming, we have federal level handlers coming in. So, which is blows my mind, yeah, blows that's awesome. my mind. But my thing is I have to put a twist on it, right? Because <clears throat> I don't want them to have to pay for it. So right. it's at no cost. Um, but then they come and I, I wanted to have this atmosphere where it's almost like a retreat for them. So for three days, you know, I want to be able to have them feel like they're at home. So, you know, we're providing three meals a day, which is elaborate buffets, all the beverages, yeah. goodie bags, like gift bags, we, we select and put together for them so they can go home with just some little special tokens for them as well as their canine. Yeah. We have motivational speakers. And so after training, the networking that happens, I wanted to just create like a safe place for them yeah. with like-minded people. Yeah, I love and, it. you know, my husband is extremely supportive of what I do and I travel a lot and I'm, I'm so busy, but for me to, all I do is talk about, this dog, this dog, canine. Oh, how about this train? Like, and he doesn't understand. And I wanted to, to have everybody come together so they can talk about their dogs. So they can yeah. talk about training. And we have successfully, this is our, our sixth seminar. Yeah. Our third big one in Maryland. So yeah. we always have one really, really big one. And it is, it is so important because this seminar potentially could save their lives. 100%. A hundred percent. And that's why as we followed along, because we've, we've, and I want people to understand, you know, what you just said, when these teams are coming to these trainings, guys, what she just said was she wants to be at no cost to them. There's no, there's no reason why a team shouldn't be able to to come out, right? It's, it's a free training for them. Um, so they do look for sponsors, um, for stuff and we're going to drop links on the show and where people can go to to donate or sponsor a team or whatnot but you know we've done it in the past we've done it again this year you know sponsoring a couple teams and it's it's a big deal guys like let's remove all the barriers for people to get the training that they need and that's one thing i so many things i love about what you're doing but it, it's not just talking about it it's it's actually doing it and removing those roadblocks for people to be able to do it. Because when you say, hey, this could save a life, that is probably the biggest understatement, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, ever. Yeah. I mean, that, that these, these men and women and their partners, I mean, they are in it. They are in the thick of it. And to be able to create scenarios and pictures, you know, for these dogs and for the, the handlers – and for that training and repetition and the decoys that you guys have, oh my gosh. I mean, you you just have some of the best of the best in the decoy world who are helping to train and develop these dogs and yeah. build that confidence up with these animals to where they just feel, you know, just uh, they're superhuman, yes. right? It's how these dogs yeah. are. And when that confidence is like that with that dog, that confidence is also there with the handler who can stay clear headed and focused in the moments. And it's a beautiful yes. thing. It really is. And it's important because we're not just that type of seminar that is just send the dog, let's do a bite. Um, it, we are doing aggression for man, you know, um, equipment fixation, like building clearing, you know, yeah. like stuff that's important, you know, vehicle stops with ex extractions, you know, yes. stuff is being done not only with the canine, um, but this is also going to save the officer's life potentially because yeah. it will happen just one time. And, um, and, and that's all it takes is one time. Yep. And we have done several scenarios um, where 
it has opened the eyes of officers. And when they would come back to the second, the second um, seminar, they, they would say to us, that, that scenario last year changed the way I did things. Yep. That's all we wanted to hear. That's it. That's that's yeah. what we want. That's huge. And so you do the one in Maryland, which is the biggest, and then yes. you do a second one. And where's yeah. that one at? We do. So we have been doing a smaller one uh, in North Carolina, up uh, outside of New Bern, North Carolina. We've okay. been doing a smaller one. Um, we are going to start, um, we are putting uh, things into production now of possibly um, starting up a mobile training unit where we will do smaller ones and, and yeah. actually go to the departments That's um, awesome. and focus on just that department. Yep. Um, it won't be all the bells and whistles where we have elaborate buffets or anything, but sure. it is this, th it will just be a training event. Um, right. but some of these departments can't get to us. So we are hoping, you know, to, to have sponsors that will, that will help us, sponsor this fund, the canine law and order fund. Yeah. So I can, you know, send my trainers to, you know, Texas, to California, to, right. to Florida, Ohio, you know, Detroit, you know, just to, to focus on the department itself and what their needs are. Yeah, that's huge. And I love that you're still 10 years in the, in the game, still looking at ways to increase impact. Yeah, you definitely. know, it's it's you've had tremendous success, you know, in these first 10 years and, you know, a third of which you're trying to figure it out. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. the thing I always <laughs> joke about when I'm talking to to CEOs and founders and stuff is that I'm like, man, how much time in the beginning were we just figuring it out? And now this is where we're at 10 years. Because I, I started with off-leash canine training. I opened my first location in January of 2014. So we're right at that 10-year mark okay, yes, also. Yes, yes. And, you know, in the beginning, it was just go, 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 go with no – I would like to say I was strategic, but I was also <laughs> working like 60-hour-a-week other job and, you know, yes. and, and starting this business. And it wasn't strategic. It was, I'm awake. I need to be working. And yeah. this is what I did. And we did that for years. Um, and I do think about the the impact we've been able to have over the years and how many families we've been able to touch and dogs we've been able to help. And I'm like, man, and we wasted so much time in the beginning trying to figure it out. Now I'm like, we should exponentially be able to have more impact in the next 10 years mm -hmm. because we're better. Right. Yes. We're, we're more yes. educated. We yes. we are more mature. We're better at our craft. We're able to develop people. It's not just you anymore. You have an amazing team of trainers and decoys um, and support staff and it, things you didn't have in the beginning. And now you do. Yes. And now yes. it's like, what is that impact the next 10 years can have? So the fact you're talking about this mobile unit is really I think it's brilliant. Yeah. And it, it's just, it was a lot of growing pains in the beginning. Um, a lot of tears um, on my part. Again, I work with all men, like, you know, yeah. you guys don't have emotions. I do. <laughs> and they used to tell me, they said, stop crying. All you do is cry. Well, leave me alone. It's my passion coming out, but yeah. I'll figure this out. And I did over the 10 years I did, <laughs> we figured it out. I still cry. And, uh, and it's okay, but yeah. because that's, it's, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm so passionate about what I do. This is, this is about not only about the dogs, but it's also about the, the officer, but in the end, we're serving the community. 100%. And I, I never would have imagined in 10 years that I would be doing this. Never, you know, I say to my husband, you know, at Law and Order, I am standing in front of, you know, there's a hundred officers there, but then there, there's another hundred people in that room. And I am standing there speaking and, and never, like this wasn't even in my wheelhouse. And I yeah. don't know how it became, but that's what I call a true calling. And, and it's agreed. Sometimes you cannot explain it and you just do it. Mm -hmm. And I was meant to do this and I, I want to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I love that so much. Talk about um, for the listeners or, you know, our viewers on YouTube and stuff, talk about the training grounds in Maryland. Um, I want people to understand kind of when you talk about 
room clearing and vehicle extractions and very realistic scenarios. Can you talk a little bit about the setup that you have there? I don't want people thinking you're doing this thing in a Lowe's parking lot. You know, well, it's, you know yes. what I mean? Well, yes. So first off, my vision, um, there was really nowhere that could hold all of us. And what, because I wanted to create that retreat like atmosphere, I, I wanted everybody to train, to eat and sleep, you know, in the same location. Yeah. So we did, um, with, with help because it takes a village, we found frontier campground, um, which is right outside ocean city, Maryland. Yep. And that was like my dream because now we have the cabins there. There is a Western town there that we utilize uh, it backs off to uh, the bay. So we have water. We're able to do water work uh, yeah. there also. And there is tons and tons of uh, woods and forests for us to do, you know, uh, tracking and, and scenario work there. Yeah. But with that Western town, we are able to recreate some realistic situation scenario trainings. But we, we do leave the property also. Sure. And we have, um, there's a school that's close by that will do some building clearing there and also a warehouse. So we're not always on that property. Right. We do utilize that property, um, but it's, we, we utilize the surrounding area there um, in order for it to really be realistic and, and, and real life. And have you been making use of that property since you started in 2020 with it? No, no. So the, the first year we were on a small farm in Virginia okay. <laughs> that nobody stayed on, you know, um, and then then we moved up to this will be our third year at, at this campground. And there's no more cabins left. We sell the cabins out. Yeah. Um, it, it's just we, we take up the whole the whole campground, which is pretty awesome. There are civilians there. There's some yes. civilians on property uh, and they love it. They, you know, they're able to watch at a safe distance and sure. see what we do. And, and it, it's, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> the one who's just clueless wondering what the hell is going on. <laughs> they're thinking yes. something really bad's going down, you know, when yes. everybody starts rolling in and then all the dogs. Oh yes. my gosh. So you, you know, you made a comment about how passionate you are about the impact it has on the community. And a hundred teams are coming out this year from across the country. People are coming out mm -hmm. and I mean, it's not community. It is communities. I mean, it is yes. communities yes. that you're impacting and what an incredible, what an incredible thing. And, you yeah. know, and, and I think that speaks volumes to you as a person. And like, I can just tell, it is our first time interacting, you and I, you know, face to face, but like you're a force, right? And I always believe when people, when they get their passion um, in alignment, right, with with their purpose, it people are unstoppable. Like it doesn't mean everything's simple and goes smooth, but like failure isn't even an option. Right. Because you're in perfect alignment with passion and purpose. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the headaches, the roadblocks, the stumbles, the the lessons learned. There's no failures. It's all lessons. And you keep falling forward because it's it's in perfect alignment. And I actually so, like that, that that saying there's no failures. There are lessons. That's yeah. actually a great saying. Yeah. I mean, I get them every day. And so, yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. I, I just stopped telling myself, Josh, you're kind of dumb. No, I'm not dumb. My failures are lessons. <laughs> My failures are lessons. Yes. And so, but the thing is, you know, when, as hard as it was, and probably still is for a female in the area that you have chosen to, to run with this thing, that you legitimately are a force. And that's why it's having the impact that it is. Because the, the universe cannot deny alignment. And I believe that so I much. I do um, too. Yeah. You know, because you're the one to do it. Nobody else. You. You're the one who had to do it. You're the one who had to have the, the vision, the thought, the idea. You're the one who had to run that that newsletter, which you hated doing, which turned into a calendar, which sparked a, huh, there's actually a lot of dogs here. And yeah. it wasn't one of those things that necessarily made a whole lot of sense as to why this was nagging at you. But you're like, I think we can help here. And it's that that 
that place where you're coming at it from an area of serve and and to to serve others, not necessarily not yourself. And it's like, okay, this is kind of a rough concept of where I am and what we're doing. And now where it's at 10 years later, the clarity of it. Meanwhile, every step and hiccup and trip along the way was a hundred percent necessary to get to where you are now. And people stop with the hiccups. They, they try to get their purpose and passion and alignment, but that first sign of trouble, that first sign of failure, that first sign of, Oh, this is going to be re- harder than I could have ever imagined. People stop. And you kept going. And, and can you talk a little bit about that? Like what, what ultimately keeps you going even on the hardest of days? So I think that my passion allows me to inspire others. I have to scream this on the top of my lungs because I certainly could not have done this without the team that I have in place, right? It definitely takes a village. And I have an amazing team right now in place who I believe that my passion inspired them. Not that they weren't, they didn't have the passion that I do, but I, I feel I'm inspiring to them. So that gives them the oomph to want to, to help also, you know, do this and make, you know, and have a purpose. Yeah. But this also brings out every vampire that possibly could exist in this industry. Yes. And not everybody is, has that same end goal. Mm -hmm. And what I try to tell my team is um, because I, Again, very emotional. I will I will cry at the drop of a dime. Someone hurts my feelings, but I get up and I and I I brush myself off and I'm like, all right, we could do this. But some people aren't in for it for the end result. They they're in for it for self profit. Yep. And I have created something that is extremely marketable. Yep. <laughs> and it, it wasn't intentional. Right. Because my passion, my passion developed this. Yeah. So it, it became this extremely marketable project. So we have some people with good intentions, but some people also with not good intentions. Yeah. And it's it's hard for me sometimes to determine who's who's actually the vampire. Right. And, and, and we have come across some really, really like not nice people. And, but we're still here and we're still going stay focused and, and, and just concentrate on the mission and not worry about, you know, those people. But I know that the people that are intended to be with us will continue to stick with us. Sure. And that's, what's rewarding. So what, um, I know you talked a little bit about the mobile unit, trying to put that the team to be mobile and go visit departments one on one and and conduct trainings for them specifically to to areas maybe they're struggling with and having problems. Mm-hmm. You know what what do you see the next you know five years looking like for Throwaway Dog Project and Canine Law and Order? I definitely see us expanding for sure. Um, I feel that that one sponsor, that one backer is finally going to get wind of us yeah. and believe in the same mission that we are and in for it for good intentions, not for them looking good or them, you know, making money off of this because yeah. it certainly is not about making money. Yeah. I have worked 10 years, um, basically just, I have no family time. I have no friend time. I have nothing because everything was put into this. So I, I believe in five years, we are going to run into that, that one sponsor that is going to say, this is freaking amazing Yeah, and, and help us fund this and that we're able to hire these trainers to, to be on our, our, our mobile unit and yeah. go and, and make a difference all over the country. And that, that's, that is my goal. And, and of course, again, never, never to charge the department, never. And yeah. this does rub people the wrong way in this industry. Some people, because this is their living, right? This is their living. This is how they make money. They go and they do seminars and they do training and 
we're not focused on the big departments that can afford training. Right. We're sure. focused on the departments that could never afford them yeah. at all. You know, that's that's our our mission is for the, the departments that can't really afford it. And yeah. um, I don't want to take anybody's job away. That was never our intention, you know, to take jobs away from hardworking people. Um, this is for departments that really don't have the funds to do this. And, yeah. and even with dogs, you know, you know, donating dogs for free. You know, you would think that, you know, there are some some brokers that are get their their panties twisted over this. But it's the brokers that are confident and know that. I'm not going to touch their business. Right. You know, yeah. It's just, I, I'm going to focus on departments that, that really can't even touch your, your products. Well, it comes back to, you know, mindset also, right? Are people approaching life, their businesses, their passions, projects, whatever, from a place of scarcity or a place of abundance? Right. And, and, and that's, the thing I talk about all the time, people are like, well, Josh, so-and-so left your team. They're going to start their own dog training business. I'm like, okay. Like, and like, it, there, there's, there's a lot of dogs out here yes. for, for people to train. Right. Like, do I think it's a good idea? No, because I know them and I know their character <laughs> and I know their, per- but that's not my problem now. Right. You know, certain people, I make it my problem if I know how they, they don't work for me because of their treatment of animals and things like that, mm-hmm. you know, is, is so off base with, with our, you know, expectations. I will absolutely try to bury that person. So they never touch a dog again, but you know, in general, like, Hey, yeah, they want to do it a different way. They want to do their own thing. I did my own thing. Like who am I to stop somebody right. from doing their own? Yeah. I don't wish to stop anybody, but I also believe in the market and, if they're negatively impacting me by doing their thing and that's negatively impacting my business, well, what changes do I need to make with my business in order to not be impacted by them doing their business? And, you know, the market is saying that's a better value. That's a better result. That's a better experience. Maybe I need to step up my game, you know, with what you're doing from the, the nonprofit side and giving that training away, we're talking about three days of training. You know, you're talking about the dogs you've placed. You said a number of you know, 57 dogs, I think, yeah. in the 10 years. Yeah. You know, half a million dollars in 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 saved money and resources for departments over those years. That's huge. If you're a broker professionally in the industry, and that's all you do and focus on, and you're worried about 57 dogs over 10 years, man, get your head out of your ass. Like, mm-hmm. you, that, that shouldn't even be a thought. Yes. If anything, they should be, they should, if they had an abundant mindset, they're thinking, hey, you know what? I love what you're doing. It's incredible what you're doing. I'm actually going to give you two dogs a year. Well, that that has <laughs> happened. And like I <laughs> right? said, our own trainers that now volunteer their time, they are, they do handler courses. They sell police dogs. Yeah. But they're like, hey, we want to be a part of this. We're not threatened by you. We want to do this with you. And that's how I have been so lucky to have some amazing trainers and some really, really good dogs donated to us that we just pay, pay it forward and and give those clarity and mission and clarity and vision. It's easy for people to get on board with. If people are truly, you said my people are going to be with me. People who are supposed to be a part of this are going to be a part of this. And when that's the case, you, you know, it is, you don't worry about, Everybody else, someone's there's somebody out there who's going to find a problem with anything, you know. Well, it, it, well those coat those coattail riders yeah. um, definitely, um, you know, have have shown themselves. Sure, and and they're not they're not successful because the mission and the passion is not there. It isn't, and that's okay. You know, that's okay. We're going to move forward and and continue to make a difference with or without them. Yeah, you stay focused on what you're doing. Yeah, and it's funny how that plays out and yes. works out. So, what are the? I want to I want to honor your time and you know and and whatnot. But what are you know before I I let you go? What what do you want people to know? You know about your group, your team, your organization that that I maybe haven't asked or we haven't talked about. And then part two is what are the best ways for people to connect? with your organization, learn more about, 
And, you know, if they felt led, you know, donate and help support what you're doing. Our team, I mean, our team is, is, is extremely dedicated and, and passionate. And I, I would hope that the public would see that just following us on social media, um, going to our website, um, just see the impact that we, we do um, it is so important. And then ultimately donate, help us do this because we cannot do it without, without the, su- the support of our followers, uh, without those donations. That's, um, awesome. that's super, super important. It's so expensive, you know, to, um, we're, we're not just like doing like rescuing a dog from a shelter and it goes into a home. I mean, it, it is so tedious and time consuming to train these dogs. Yeah. Um, our trainers are, are, their time is very precious and not everything is for free. <laughs> right. So, you know, our trainers that we, you know, they can only donate so much of their time, but yeah. at some point we, they have to be paid. Sure. And, and so we need the help of, of our followers uh, to, to make donations and help sure. us continue this, this mission. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Carol, I can't thank you enough for taking time this morning to jump on and share your story. It's super inspiring and motivating. I want to go run through a wall right now and like, what do, what do I need to do better? Who, who else can we help? You, uh, should, you should come to Law & Order and check it out. I would love for you to see it. Yeah, I do. I actually, I'll check the calendar and see if I'm, if I'm not traveling, cause I've got a couple buddies who are going to be up there. And, um, and so there's, several good reasons to to pop in but i'll look at it and i'll let you know for sure if not you still know you know we're supporting you and we're going to be um uh promoting your stuff and i'm actually with your permission i'm going to tie a link to y'all sites and donate pages um to our sites um, cross promoting and we'll get you guys in our next newsletters that you love so much (laughs) uh (laughs) As long as I, I don't have to write them no more. So. Yeah, you, yeah, I love them. I haven't written one in a while, so I love them now. I really do. But we're going to do everything we can to to spread the word to, you know, however however we can to the best of our ability, and and hopefully that helps get some additional support over your way. But thank, thank you. you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for being a badass person, a oh, great thanks, human Josh. being, and thank I can't wait to connect with you again, um, guys. I appreciate you all tuning in. Share the show. Share Carol's story, share their websites, their social media, follow them on there. If you got questions for Carol, hit us up and we'll send them her way if you want to learn more about the Throwaway Dogs Project. And we're going to catch you next time on the Big Dog Podcast. 